So for those of you who did not raise their hands, um, Shazam is a really cool app. You should get it. Uh, it's on the Play Store, on the App Store. It's really awesome on Windows as well. So, yeah. um, so when I meet people, they uh, and I tell them, yeah, I work at Shazam. Uh, they typically ask me like, oh, like how does it work? Like I press a button and it tells me what song I'm listening to. Like how how does it do that? Um, And yeah, that's a big secret. Um, that's one of our recognition clusters. Um, yeah, but I'm actually here to talk about how we work with data. Um, and uh, to give you like a high level uh, understanding of our infrastructure, um, this is kind of like a partial view of what our data architecture looks like. Um, essentially, we start with events uh, generated by the mobile app. Um, we store them in S3. Uh, we do everything in AWS. Um, and then we use uh, Scalding to process those events and store them in uh, Dynamo, Redshift, uh, back to S3, send them to like the REST APIs, um, Whatever. So uh, Scalding has kind of become our central to our data processing. And that's the, what this talk is about. So what is Scalding? Um, Scalding is a Scala DSL on top of Cascading. Cascading in turn is a Java library that compiles to MapReduce jobs that run on Hadoop. Um, Martin mentioned uh, the features of Scala that make it ideal for DSL this morning. Um, and that's, that's essentially, that applies equally well to Spark as well as to Scalding. Um, Scalding has been, uh, was developed originally at Twitter. Um, it was open source there and they still contribute fairly actively to it. Uh, the jobs that are written in Scalding ultimately compile down to MapReduce. Um, Latest version of uh, Cascading works with other execution engines, uh, specifically like with Tez, and there are rumors of uh, potentially using Spark or Flink as a backend execution engine. The key abstractions to understanding Scalding are the sources, pipes, and sinks. Um, data flows from the sources through pipes and gets dumped into sinks. The way you interact with these abstractions is uh, through two APIs. One is called the fields API. Um, does anyone know what this tick line and tick word are? Call it out. Symbols, Symbols yeah. They're actually a core feature of Scala, but they're not actively used. Uh, actually, Scalding is one of the few places where I've seen them used. Um, the fields API is deprecated. You should not be using it. Uh, I'll instead be focusing on the typed API. Uh, this is a Scala conference. I don't have to sell types to you. Um, this is just way better. And like I said, the other one's not. It still works, but it's not actively developed. And all the kind of like development resources are going into the typed API. Um, it can use uh, tuples, it can also use uh, case classes. There are macros to get it to read into case classes that are really cool when they're kind of advanced feature of uh, Scalding. Uh, the pipes have a bunch of operations. Um, I'm not gonna go through them, but essentially they just look like Scala collections. Uh, you have, you know, filter, you have flat map, you have map. All the stuff you expect on a, a Scala collection and even more. Um, there are a number of join implementations. Uh, where they come in handy is that if you know a relative size of one of your pipes versus another, uh, you can kind of hint to Scalding and um, it, it will run the join in an optimal way, right? Um, so for example, like if you join with a tiny uh, pipe, that tiny pipe is gonna be replicated to all your mapper nodes uh, 
and that's going to be much more efficient. Uh, testing is something that often gets ignored in data processing. Uh, it's actually really important. Uh, and it's, it's a first uh, class citizen in scalding. Um, so if you have a batch job running uh, regularly, like you want to know that it can handle whatever input you want to throw at it, right? Um, and where this really comes in and becomes handy is uh, when you have to add features down the line. Uh, like half a year after you originally written it and you have, don't remember what it is, right? Uh, testing gives you a sample input, sample output, and just verifies that everything runs correctly. Um, the scaling tests, uh, they run a standard Scala test suit. Um, you just specify the arguments. Then for any uh, sources, you specify where to get the data. Uh, and you do all the verification in your sync. The one challenge uh, is f in a scalding job, um, all the, your kind of setup goes into the job constructor. That means it gets really hard to unit test. You can use a reflection to kind of get around it. Um, or what I frequently do is uh, in my job, I just uh, mix in a trait, and then I can instantiate that trait and run my unit test on the trait just separately without scalding. So. so this is a big data conference, so I'm contractually obligated to show you a word count example. Otherwise, Alexi will take away my big data lessons. Um, I'm going to go through a more involved example. And I, I'll call that like a word histogram. Essentially, what we want to do is um, see what percentage of the word or of all the words in a document are represented by a specific word. Um, and uh, I'm going to run this on song lyrics. So to start, uh, your job class is going to extend from the scalding job. Uh, the arguments is what gets provided in a command line. Uh, I use them for paths, uh, essentially where I want to get the data. and. This is the first pipe. Uh, these are kind of like the, I guess, stop words, you know, like words that are frequently occurring and that we don't care to count. Uh, so I load them in as text. It's just one word per line. Create a type to pipe from them. And then group them by identity. Um, I do the group because I want to uh, join this pipe in later. So that becomes important later. Um, now we load the actual document, the song lyrics. Uh, so we take the input, uh, tokenize it. So now at this point we have a pipe of individual words, uh, group them by identity, and then do the left join. So the way to think about the left join is if you think about the uh, left join in a kind of like a relational table, you have all your values from the left table, and then what, whichever values from the right table uh, match on some key, you get those columns there. Uh, but if they don't match, you just get nulls. Except in Scala, we hate nulls, right? So we use option. Um, so when I do the flat map on the values, what I get is a tuple of the word from the left table, and then an option of the word from the right table. Uh, in this case, if the, option, if the option is sum, that means I have a stop word in my right table, so I just want to ignore it and uh, remove it from further processing. Uh, if I get a none, that means this is not a frequently appearing word, so I just wrap it in an option and attach a one for counting. Um, and because I'm doing the flat map, um, this option essentially goes away. All the nones goes away, so at this point, I, I'm left with, um, it's still a grouped pipe, uh, but it contains the tuples of the word and the count. And I don't care about the group key, so I just get the values. All right. Um, now, to get the total number of uh, words uh, without the ignored words, uh, just take that count and sum them up, 
and I get the total pipe. It's still a pipe, it's not an actual value, uh, because what we're doing here is we're kind of setting up co computation. Um, then I take the, all the words, uh, group them by the word again, take their size, so count them up, um, convert them to pipe, um, then get the percentage that the word represents of the total by using this map with value. So the total pipe is a value pipe. Essentially, it's a pipe that contains a single value, single number. Um, so this is actually a join, but it's a really efficient join because that value can just go to all the mapper nodes. Um, and then at this point, we're done, but I only care about the top 10 most frequently occurring words. So I just uh, order them, take uh, the 10, and write them to the output. Um, I ran this on some top five Led Zeppelin songs and top five Justin Bieber songs, and here's some results. Um, before I go on, any questions? Is anyone like thoroughly confused? Make sense? Cool. This is going to be a short presentation, you guys. All right. Um, so back in the MapReduce days, um, the way the Google described MapReduce, it's a very kind of a classic, you know, scatter gather um, algorithm, right? But uh, the way it's always implemented is um, there's this intermediate stage. Essentially, uh, if you have a mapper that has to rely on the reducer to do the counting, that means the mapper has to send it a tuple of, oh, I saw the word and once. Oh, I saw the word and once. I saw the word and once, multiple times. And that gets uh, really uh, bandwidth heavy on the network. Um, so Hadoop has introduced the notion of a combiner, which essentially runs a mini reducer in the mapper node, uh, takes those tuples of and, sums those them up, and says to the reducer, hey, I saw and you know, 55 million times. Um, and that's an optimization. Um, cascading and scalding, they did kind of similar. It's a, a kind of like a map side aggregation, uh, not necessarily a combiner, but um, it, it works in the same way. And it makes sense for counts, right? Uh, but are there any other structures that this works for? And it turns out, yes, as long as you have a merge operations, you can represent uh, your data structure in a way that Scalding will be able to do this optimization on the mapper side. Um, so uh, the merge operation is present in these things called semigroups. Um, if you have a zero, you get a monoid, and a bunch of them are available in the library called Algebird. Um, and I listed some of the kind of like the not frequent occurring ones here. Um, you get them for essentially all the primitive types for things like sets, maps, lists. Um, uh, but out of these, like hyperloglog, -log, uh, turns out to be really effective for doing distinct counts, right? Uh, it's an approximate algorithm, uh, but if uh, you have to do a unique count, it's uh, very effective. And the thing is, like, when you start working with scalding, like you have no idea that there's these monoids under the hood and you have no idea what those are. Um, but then one day you have to look at the sum method and it takes like an implicit monoid and you just look like Woody here. Um, ordered serialization is another kind of like a cool optimization on the latest scalding release. Um, what this does is it, uh, it can speed up your uh, scalding job by around 40%. Um, so when a MapReduce job needs to shuffle data, uh, the records, they get collected at the mapper and then serialized, sent to the reducer, reducer deserializes them, sorts them, serializes them, 
and writes them to disk. So um, if it's able to do this sort on just the incoming bytes without doing the deserialization, serialization, you save a lot of CPU. Um, and that's what this feature does. Essentially, you have to uh, define this macro, uh, pull it in, and um, yeah, it does it for you. As long as you use like primitive types or case classes, it will generate all the code uh, that's needed under the hood. So what is it like to write a sculling job? The way I do it is I typically write a test first in a kind of like a standard TDD fashion. Um, I set up my sources, my sinks. Um, those are typically uh, defined by the job description, you know, by the problem. Um, and then let the types guide you. Uh, essentially, like I use IntelliJ and I get code completion. So when I type a dot on a pipe, um, it gives me all the methods I can use and I look for the one that I want to get out of that pipe. Uh, and it's a very effective way to work. So this is a really simple recommendations algorithm. It's not gonna win you a million bucks, uh, but it does demonstrate a couple of interesting scalding features. Um, we, we start with like a input of um, a user, an item, and a rating. So a user has rated some item, gave it like a one or a five. Um, we create a matrix out of them. So this uses a scalding matrix API. Uh, if you have a type, uh, in this case, it's uh, input tuple is a, uh, it has a type of for the row, for the column, and for the value. As long as you have those three, you can create a matrix out of it. Um, do the normalization, get the edges between items, uh, and then use the dim sum cosine similarity, which is like an approximate cosine similarity, and there is a blog post from Twitter that describes this in more detail. Um, it's also one of those optimization things when you have like millions of items to compare. Uh, it cuts down the CPU use and uh, runs your job much faster. And yeah, finally like unfold it, uh, remove self-similarity, and just write it out. Uh, so basic recommendation algorithm and like four steps. Yeah, so some tips, um, use the types to your advantage. Uh, can anyone tell me what's in this pipe? Two strings, but do you know what they are? I don't know. So what if I tell you this? It's, it's the same code, essentially, uh, but this uh, type alias, just use it for documentation, because now I, I can read this, I, I know exactly what's in this pipe, and I don't have to remember, oh, is the account ID first, is the song ID first? This is much more clear. Uh, you can also use a, a debug operation on a pipe. So when you have a sequence of these operations, they get kind of long. Insert the debug in the middle. It will print out the contents of the pipe at that point. So after it's run the mapper, but before it ran the flat map. Um, if it's a lot of output, you can limit it by providing this kind of like a configuration object, tell it where the output goes, uh, tell it how often to print the tuples, uh, if it needs to print the column names, things like that. Sometimes you actually want to see what the end uh, DAG will be created by cascading. Um, each of these is like a MapReduce stage, um, and you, you can generate this file from uh, by using the scalding tool and passing it the tool graph parameter. Um, normally, you would run your job through the scalding tool, but uh, if, if this parameter is present, present uh, it will not run the job. It will do like a dry run, compile it, and write out this file, which you can feed to GraphViz. Uh, and yeah, just look at it. 
Uh, Etsy has also released a JVM profiler for Hadoop and specifically for scalding. Um, it attaches a little agent to each one of your mappers and uh, reducers uh, and generates this uh, flame graph as, as long, uh, in addition to a bunch of other metrics. Is anyone familiar with flame graphs? Okay, so I better explain it. Uh, so what you have here is um, on the x-axis you have time, and on the y-axis you have the stack depth. And you can't read this, but all of these are like um, class paths and uh, method names. So it's w each horizontal bar is whatever method is executing at this time. So you can imagine like the lowest level is your main Java method that gets executed. And then as it calls in deeper and deeper into the stack, you go deep and then these uh, methods actually don't execute for too long, they just execute and terminate. Um, and where you have kind of long uh, bars, that means there is a lot of time spent in there. Uh, so this one is like decompressing the input stream. Uh, so presumably it's reading the data from desk and doing the decompression. Um, and then the rest is like your computation. Um, and uh, it, that JVM profiler, it can write the, all the data to generate this flame graph. It, uh, it writes it to like graphite or um, InfluxDB. Uh, it does require a little bit of setup. So um, Concurrent, which is a company behind uh, Cascading, they release a product called Driven. Um, and it generates this uh, kind of a map of your uh, task computations, this DAG, and also monitors your running job and uh, prints out some counters and lets you see where potential uh, bottlenecks in your computation could be. So you've heard about Spark enough at this conference. Um, so you might be asking like, how is it different from scalding? Like when would you use one versus another? Um, so I gave you like word count examples, but their API is essentially the same. Um, even for non-trivial jobs, uh, you can translate from one to another. Um, I typically find that scalding jobs tend to be more stable, especially given uh, with like um, serialization and memory handling. Um, Spark obviously has like MLlib and GraphX and streaming and Spark SQL and a bunch of other libraries. So your choice is gonna be driven by whatever problem you're solving. Um, uh, Spark gets talked a lot about for its performance and it's definitely faster. Uh, scalding on TES is supposedly uh, just as fast. Um, and deploying scalding today is uh, pretty much much easier than deploying Spark, especially if you have an existing Hadoop cluster, but that's changing really, really fast. Um, yeah, and uh, on this point, there's a great post uh, from Etsy by, I believe, Dan McKinley that's uh, titled uh, Choose Boring Technology, uh, where he argues that us developers, we get attracted to shiny things and we jump on the latest, greatest technology. Uh, but for some problems, it actually makes sense to use something that's maybe more uh, boring, more proven, and just to get the job done. Uh, with that, Shazam is hiring. If this is interesting, let me know, talk to me, and uh, any questions? So the question is about format we use for storing. Um, what we ingest is JSON, uh, because that's easiest for apps to send. And then from there, we transcode it into a bunch of formats um, and then feed it through our pipelines. So we use a bunch of stuff. Uh, within our pipelines, um, if we read in JSON, we quickly transform it into case classes and tuples. Um, if we read in Avro, then it's kind of
kind of translates into a, a case class automatically, same with Parquet. Um, so the, in, um, in Scalding, there are macros to generate uh, case classes from schemas uh, for Parquet specifically. And I, I think there's, there might be one forever as well. Not sure. Uh, we've tested it out. We use it for some things. Um, like I said, uh, you know, when faced with a problem, uh, I, if it doesn't require like heavy machine learning, I just go with scalding. It's proven. It works. There's a lot of infrastructure, and uh, also with deployment, like uh, we are on AWS, and uh, Spark wasn't supported by AWS until. Recently, it was possible to install it using like bootstrap scripts, uh, but it was just a pain. Anyone else? Cool. Um, I'm around the rest of the conference, so if you guys have any other questions, uh, find me. Thanks. <laughs>